Hi guys. So today we're going to continue our look at uh, kind of the Native American relationships with the settlers in the colonies by talking about some of the specific uh, wars and conflicts that were going on between the two groups. So we're going to start by talking about probably one of the more important conflicts, which is Bacon's Rebellion. Um, so of course, we're not talking about bacon, the food. Uh, we're talking about a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. So this uh, particular set of notes you don't have a graphic organizer for, so you're just going to have to take your notes yourself. Uh, so make sure you've got something to do that with. So just to give you a little bit of background, so Bacon's Rebellion takes place in Virginia, 1675. So just kind of the background of what's going on there. Uh, in order to kind of imagine this, I want you to imagine that you are an indentured servant living in colonial Virginia. All right. So you were probably a poor person in England. You wanted to start a new life. So you got someone to pay for you to come onto a ship and come over to the United States, or the American colonies, rather, and you work for a farmer. So the farmer that you work for in Virginia has a tobacco farm, okay? So tobacco pretty much is the only reason that the Virginia colony survived. Uh, it, if you think about it, it's a drug, right? Drugs sell. And so tobacco started to sell very well in England when people realize the kind of qualities it had and what they could do with it. And so the tobacco farm really becomes kind of the main farm in the American colonies. Uh, everyone is trying to plant it because the idea is that that's what's going to make you money. So everybody in Virginia has a tobacco farm. And it is everywhere. So this is the situation that you are as, coming into as an indentured servant working on somebody's plantation in the tobacco farm. Um, so this is just a picture of what tobacco looks like when it's growing. Uh, you've probably seen it around. We grow a lot of it here in North Carolina. Uh, so this is probably something you are familiar with. The, this bottom picture down here is cured tobacco. So after you pick it, basically what you do is you let it dry out, and that's what you make um, cigarettes out of or pipe tobacco, whatever you're using to smoke. So here's where your notes really pick up. All right. So here's the problem, right? Tobacco is very hard on the land that it grows in. It sucks up a lot of the nutrients out of the soil. And because it is really the only crop that people are growing, everybody's economy and labor force is dependent on tobacco, right? So if you uh, are not a tobacco farmer, you're probably not doing very well, right? But the problem is, is you also have a lot of competition because everybody, and I mean everybody, is growing tobacco. And if something happens to hurt the tobacco industry, it's going to hurt everybody, right? So um, the other kind of issues that are going on, there is not a lot of education. So people are not getting out of the tobacco industry, especially indentured servants. They're pretty much staying in that. And there are also uh, not many cities developing in the southern United States. You kind of seen this a little bit already uh, with the last notes that you took. Uh, indentured servants are getting pretty frustrated because the whole point of an indentured servant is after five to 10 years, usually seven years is the average. Um, but after about seven years, indentured servants are free to go, right? They get a set of clothes, they get some money, um, and they are basically told, good luck, we'll see you next week, right? Well, you're poor, taxes are high, and there's not a whole lot of land left for you to have, for you to be able to buy as an indentured servant. And so indentured servants are pretty frustrated with the situation here in the colonies, all right? So the question is, what if something happens? What if something goes wrong in the tobacco industry? Well, something does, right? Of course it does. So here's the problem. The market is flooded with tobacco and the price of tobacco plummets. So this is gonna be kind of my little prop here to help you symbolize this. Now this is obviously not tobacco. This is a money tree, right? We should grow money. Um, but I'm going to have this here to remind you what the importance of the tobacco is to this whole thing. So there's too much tobacco into the market. 
and there's basically more supply than there is a demand, and the price drops. When the price drops, small farmers, particularly people who used to be indentured servants, are not making any money. And the key to being a farmer is that you're pretty much always going to go into debt, right? So farmers are going into debt, and there are still heavy, heavy taxes on farmers. Recipe for disaster, right? So the other problem is, as tobacco is harsh on the land, the soil needs time to replenish in order to be able to grow more tobacco, okay? So what are we going to do about it, right? Well, at first the colonists thought, well, we could just get more land, right? So we can't use this land because it needs to replenish the nutrients, so we can get more land. And if we can get more land, we can grow more tobacco. And if we can grow tobacco, we can sell more of it, and we can make some more money and maybe get out of debt, right? This is really bad economics, by the way, because all that's doing is just putting more tobacco on the market. But these guys weren't very smart. So the colonists need more land. Problem is, there is no more land for the colonists, right? But there's still land out there. And who has it? Well, if you're thinking the Native Americans, you are right. Um, so just looking at this here, the area of Virginia that we are talking about is the Chesapeake. This is known as the Tidewater area of Virginia. So that's what we're looking at here. So you can see right here, this is where Bacon lives. And this is where a tribe of Native Americans called the Okachees live, right? So, the Native Americans are the ones with that land. Of course, we have signed treaties with them, said you stay on your land, we'll stay on our land, and nobody will be any of the worse off for it. Um, borders have been drawn, we've clarified what's ours and what's theirs. But, that's not really stopping the colonists who want the land. So there starts to be some conflicts between the Native Americans and the colonists. And farmers begin to invade the Powhatan lands in the west. And it just ends up getting really ugly really quickly. And a group of farmers, a group of these people who are invading these lands, kill a group of Sasquanux Indians. And I said that wrong. I apologize. But a group of them are killed in a struggle. All right. Well, as you can imagine, this pisses off the other people in their tribe, and they start to retaliate. And so pretty much, we become all-out war between the farmers who are trying to take the land away from the Native Americans and the Native Americans who are trying to retaliate against the farmers. So this is just a picture here um, of some farmers who are fighting the Native American tribe. You can see they've built a barricade. Um, the natives are back in the woods here. So this is just a depiction of kind of some of the things that was going on. Um, so there is a cry for war. The colonists want to go to war against the natives, and they ask for help from the government. But the government of Virginia, a guy named William Berkeley, says, no, nah, man, y'all brought this on yourself. We're not, we can't go to war. We don't have the money, right? Like, our economy sucks. This is all up to you. So he refuses to authorize the war, and the farmers get pissed at the government, right? Of course they do. They always are. So the farmers get pissed at the government, and in steps our notorious hero, Nathaniel Bacon. So Nathaniel Bacon is not actually a poor farmer. He's actually not rich, but he's doing pretty good for himself, right? And he decides he doesn't like the fact that the government refused to declare war on the Native Americans. So he steps in and gets together a group of poor farmers, indentured servants, and even some slaves, and they start to go on a rampage. And they are mad at two groups of people, the colonists, or the uh, natives, and the governor, the government of Virginia, okay? So the rebellion starts. Um, basically, the first thing they're doing is making war on native tribes for their land. They're trying to take more land so they can grow more tobacco. Second thing that they do is start to loot the wealthy people in the white plantations. They're basically like, wait a minute, y'all have got too much land and we don't have enough, so we want what you have. So they start to invade the farms of the wealthy whites as well. Um, then, eventually, they're so angry and they're in such a rampage that they march into Jamestown and burn Jamestown to the ground. Right, so they burn their capital city. Um, this is just another picture here of Bacon getting his men all riled up. And if you look, you can see these guys on this side. These are his poor farmers. You can see that they're dressed very differently. This is the government over here. And these guys are angry at these guys, right? And you can see the differences in how they're dressed. Um, again, pay attention to the way Bacon is dressed. 
he is obviously not a poor farmer, right? He just kind of wants to go up against the government because, you know, that's what you do when you're bored, I guess. Um, this is just a picture, sorry it's a little grainy, of Jamestown being burned. This is a big deal. Jamestown is like the original colony, right? So it's a pretty big deal that Jamestown is burning. It's sending a pretty massive message that they're burning their capital, as I said. Um, so it seems like everything's going great for Nathaniel Bacon and his rebellion until Bacon dies pretty suddenly. Like, whoops, our leader's dead. Now what? Right? Well, suddenly all these farmers and these indentured servants and even the slaves, as I said, they don't really know what to do now. Like, their leader just died, and there's not really anybody to step up and take his place. So the rebellion actually just kind of fizzles out. Like, they really needed a good, strong, middle-class guy to say, we need to fight the government. But once he's dead, the rest of them are kind of like, well, I don't really know if we're ready up for this. Um, after the rebellion fades out, the House of Burgesses, which is the legislative body in Virginia, the body that makes the laws for the colony, the Virginia Assembly, votes to lower taxes and try to open up some land. So the rebellion actually is pretty successful. You might want to just add that to your notes, that the rebellion is successful. Um, taxes are down, right? Land is opened up. Uh, so the farmers actually end up getting what they want, right? Taxes are going to help, lower taxes are going to help them out. Getting more land is going to help them out when it comes to growing their tobacco, right? So this is a pretty big deal. Um, however, here's the really big realization that comes out of this. They realize, because of this, that indentured servitude is not working. Indentured servants will one day be free. And when they are free, they want to own their own things, you know, like land, freedom, rights, money, right? And if we just keep bringing more indentured servants in, what we're really just going to end up is with more poor people who are trying to take land away from the rich people. So indentured servants is actually not a great system for rich people who need free labor and don't want to have to let them go and give them land and money. So what are they going to turn to next? Again, you probably guessed it. They need a new source of labor, one that's not going to give them these problems, and that new source of labor is slavery. So really around this time period, the Virginia Company, or not the Virginia Company, the Virginia Colony, excuse me, starts to increase their importation of African slaves, brings them into the colony, and eventually African slaves are going to go on to replace indentured servants 100% as the source of labor on these tobacco farms, okay? So that's really one of the big effects to get out of this, all right? Um, so I'm gonna move my money tree back over here, and we're gonna look at a couple more uh, instances of conflict here really quickly. Um, the first one is the Pequot Wars. So this actually happens before Bacon's Rebellion from 1636 to 1637. And the Pequots are a tribe in the Connecticut River Valley. So if you look kind of in this area, right? So they controlled the fur trade in the region. The middle colonies depended a lot on the fur trade. Connecticut is one of the middle colonies. Um, so they're depending on the fur trade in this region. And they are associating with the Pequots quite a bit in order to trade with them. Um, however, there is an attack on one of the Pequot villages by the white settlers and some of their allies who are Native Americans uh, in order to try and gain control of the fur trade. Basically, they're, the white people are like, we don't want to have to deal with the Pequots anymore. We want to try and control the fur trade. So they get some buddies together, some allies, some Native Americans that they are the um, friends with, the Nargisset, and again, I probably pronounced that wrong, apologize, um, and they attack a Pequot village on the Mystic River. Uh, whites start burning their homes. As people are starting to flee the village, they are shot in the back as they are fleeing, the survivors. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is a massive tragedy. Uh, they kill almost all of the Pequots in that area, pretty much knock them all out. Um, again, this was so they could control the fur trade. They're trying to take control of the fur trade from them. Um, so this is just a sketch of the Pequot village. You can see that these are all the people surrounding the village firing on the Pequots here. Um, we've got the Native Americans and the white people firing on the Pequot village. Uh, so that's just a picture of that. 
Uh, so that is the first of these conflicts. The second of these conflicts is King Philip's War. So King Philip's War takes place in 17, or 1675 to 1676. And basically there's a guy named Metacom. Okay? So the white people didn't like the name Metacom, apparently, and so they started calling him King Philip. And so Metacom is the leader of several different Indian nations that he wants to unite and try to fight the white people, basically, to rise up against some of the whites who are um, in the colonies. And so he unites several different tribes, some of them who had been enemies, and they start attacking settlements all throughout New England. They coordinate all these attacks and agree that we're going to like burn these villages down at the same time. So basically these are the natives burning white villages now, right? So a lot of the people that had been living on like the outskirts of New England are starting to flee into Boston, right? Like they had been living out in the frontier, living on their own, but because of all these different attacks, they're not safe. And so they start to retreat into the city of Boston, right? So the war ends in a pretty big failure once Boston gets involved, right? When Boston starts to send their own troops in order to protect the whites, um, the war ends in a pretty massive failure for the Indians. Medicom is beheaded. He is drawn and quartered. So if you don't know what this means, this is usually something reserved for treason. Um, so if you're tried for treason against the government, what this means is they will hang you, okay? And you are suffocating to death, hangings, you know, they're suffocating you. And just before you're about to die, they cut you down, right? So you get <gasps> a deep breath, oh, God, I'm free. And then, while you are still about to die, right, they cut you open from your neck to your stomach, from the base of your stomach, your guts spill out. Right, gross and nasty, Blech. right? Then they cut you into four pieces. You're dead by this point, right? So your head is gonna be left in the main part of the city, the Boston in this case. The other four parts of you are sent to the four corners of the colony, right? So the north, south, east, and west. And it's a symbol to all of the other would-be traders, or in this case, the natives, uh, that if they try to fight the white people, this is what's gonna happen to him. Uh, after Metacomp is killed, his wife and son are sold into slavery. And this is really the last serious threat to New England. Uh, he was almost successful. After this, there will be a lot of conflicts on the outskirts, and there will be some attacks by the natives onto white settlements and vice versa. But really, after this point, they don't stand much of a chance. The white settlers are just way too better armed better coordinated, and it's a big issue for um, these guys. So this kind of wraps up just kind of some of the things that we were looking at here, some of these different conflicts. Uh, as you can see, it turned violent very quickly. We went from the beginning of the colonies where the natives are basically helping the white settlers survive to the natives um, being threatened both life and land by the white settlers who are trying to expand westward. And this is going to be a pretty common theme in American history really until the 1880s. Uh, so that's kind of where we are ending off with today. Uh, I will see you guys in class. Goodbye.